Our speaker tonight is Brian Oxner, or as I like to call him, The Ox. He is an aspiring hemp farmer, he's one of the oldest members of Liberating on the Rocks, and he is otherwise a cool dude. So give it up for Brian. Thanks, John. First of all, thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate your time. And um, I'm a, um, I have a unique background in, in, in your call, I went in farming. So I'm a marketing strategist and copywriter here in Denver and farm in Kansas part time during the summer. So it's kind of like being a double life, but I think it's really given me a really interesting perspective on, on farming and, and, and business in general. So, um, how I got started with industrial hemp is about six years ago. I was uh, at my parents' farm, wake up one morning and have it, and um, had a seizure. So it was really not a fun, not a fun deal. Long story short, I got to here to Denver to St. Anthony's, St. Anthony's West. Spent about a week in the hospital, and um, after that, you know, some not not really fun things to have. I think I to make sure this never happens to me again. So I came across the Charlotte's Web store. Anybody ever hear that? Uh, the CD story yeah. about the little girl. Okay, so so anyway, read this story and then just went down the rabbit hole and did more research on hemp. And I'm like, this just makes sense. I mean, this, as a crop, as a as a as a commodity, and just in, in, for a lot of things in general. So um, the basis of hemp is I'm sure everybody knows. Just for just for a little recap, um, industrial hemp is part of the. It's similar to marijuana, but it's different. It's in the same plant family, cannabis sativa L. It has 0.3% THC or less. And this is where people get confused between the difference between hemp and marijuana. They think that, that hemp is the same thing as marijuana, but it's not. THC is obviously the chemical that provides the high in, in, in marijuana. And CBD is a, is a similar compound, but it actually, ha it actually fights psychoactive effects of, of THC. So, um, I'll just give a kind of a history of what why cannabis was banned in the first place, where it is here in agriculture today, and why I believe no matter what the happens the economy, regardless of who gets elected office, I think cannabis and industrial hemp is will be one of the best, most exciting dynamic industries of our lifetimes. I really, I really believe that. So, so to start with, um, so with the reason industrial hemp is such a valuable. But I guess the back to the basics. It's a um, industrial hemp is a non-psychoactive crop that has thousands of different uses and markets. And it's not just me saying this. This came from Popular Mechanics in February 1938. I'll show you this real quick screen here. And the reason hemp was made legal in the first place was because of politics and crony capitalism. Um, hemp was popular up until the end of the Civil War when they had slave labor to, to, to hemp harvest the, the hemp. After the Civil War, slavery was, was abolished and then that cheap labor went away. So it was really, it was difficult for farmers to, you know, find paid labor to, to, to harvest hemp. But in 1935, there was a, there was a machine event called the Corticator that allowed, um, that made it easier to process hemp and it would make hemp from, paper from hemp cheaper than paper from trees. And this threatened the, the business empire of, of a guy named William Randolph Hearst, one crazy dude. So Hearst setup was was all in in the in the, in the lumber paper, um, I guess business. He owned the newspapers, which he you know printed you know newspapers, lumber mills that made that paper were made from, and he also owned the, the forests, the the, 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 the 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 trees. So obviously this. If this machine came to fruition, he was going to lose a lot of money. And this is in the mid 30s in the heart of the Great Depression. So people were obviously very, very nervous about losing any livelihood or any, any threat to their wealth. And the funny thing is that I've learned here in my hemp journey today, it's way more different than it was 80 years ago. There's people in agriculture that have, that they've taken years and decades to carve out a niche and egg. And now they see it you know, being threatened or maybe even being limited as far as their jobs or their. Their influence. I'll get back to that um, later on. So, so I, the obvious question was: if this is such a valuable crop with thousands of uses, 
Um, you know, why was it made for? I already sorry. <laughs> already 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 um, explained that. So so what happened? What um, should be? William Randolph first and his buddy named Harry Anselm again mm -hmm. is they put a um, put together a false PR campaign. This is probably one of the first instances of fake news. <laughs> so they, they they made up stories just out of whole cloth that um, you know people would smoke marijuana because you know. Blacks and Mexicans would raise black women. You're really like a racist. No, that's true. But, that's not true. Well, that was Rodney, our black man, who said that. Yeah, right. right. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, getting back to the getting back to the story. So they made this this crazy PR campaign up. And they made this movie called Reef for Matters. Oh, yeah. I mean, have you ever seen the movie? Oh, yeah. Movie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, and I know. This I know. is the greatest film. Obviously, I'm not an actor, I'm not a theater critic. That's some of the worst acting you've ever seen. <laughs> I'm serious. It's really, really bad. And I'm looking at this like, how do people fall for this crap? <laughs> so, anyhow, but it's like, like a lot of things in, in American society, people don't think, they just react. So, this, this propaganda campaign, you know, they have this new drug called marijuana, was a they thought it was a threat to the um, American way of life. Marijuana was never a word in the, in the American vocabulary until Hurst and Anslinger brought it in. It described a type of Mexican wild tobacco. So cannabis was widened, even up until 37, when, that, when they put the, the Marijuana Tax Act and they eventually banned cannabis. Cannabis was a very widely used medicine. And so what, what the writers of this, of this, this law did is they, is they, they were banning him, but they didn't say they were banning him. So people didn't really know the details until they got <coughs> until the bill was passed and it was too late. So that's the reason it was so the so the marijuana tax act was passed on October 37, and the article in Popular Mechanics was in February 1938. Because back then information didn't quite travel quite as quite as quickly. And then they didn't people really had to unpack the law about what it meant and what it meant for the for the hemp of cannabis industries. So what does that, that say? It says over 5,000 uses? Is that what it says? Yeah, yeah. This is from the Positive Mechanics um, article. It says, Hemp is the standard fiber of the world. It has great tensile strength and durability. It's used to produce more than 5,000 textile products, ranging from rope to fine laces. And go to the next page. We don't need 5,000 uses. Well, we need 4,960. <laughs> right. We're not here. It says, and can be used to produce more than 25,000 products ranging from dynamite to cellophane. Wow. I have to laugh at some of these people we talk to that some folks that we don't know much about hemp. They say, oh yeah, hemp will be, hemp will be saturated in three years. I'm like, no, sorry, Bubba. <laughs> See, in 38, let's, let's do see the map on, on the on the uses for what they knew back then versus what they know versus what they know today. So in 38, if it's if that was a new billion dollar crop back then, in today's dollars, that makes it about an 18 billion dollar crop. In, 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 and then, and back then, the CBD wasn't even invented, or it wasn't invented, but it wasn't discovered until 1940 by, by a researcher at the University of Illinois. So, CBD itself is, is almost a billion dollar market. And now, and the, the crazy thing is that it's, it's not just, just that it's a, it's a beneficial cannabinoid. Um, Scientists have discovered over a hundred different cannabinoids. CBD and THC are the two most popular, but there's also others on the, on the rise that people are doing, scientists are doing, doing more research on, like CBN and CBG. I think in the future, what you'll you'll see is is not just CBD oil, but you'll be able to, like, to order like designer cannabinoids. You know, maybe you know write a DNA test, and then they'll they can put the pieces. You know, you need this much CBD. This much terpenes, CBG, CBN. I think that's what that's where it's headed. And and the health benefits of of, of the cannabinoids are really are um, there's there's a there's a, a multitude of them. There really are. That's the back to the charts web story about fighting seizures. Um, it's an anti-inflammatory. I just helps with pain, appetite. Um, but the really cool thing I did, I did what I learned about cannabinoids is about a, about a year ago I did the research on a uh, marketing project for a CBD company. 
And what the coolest thing I found out about, about uh, hemp and the, the derivatives of hemp is that our bodies are basically designed to consume cannabis, which is not like a crazy thing. But in, in every vertebrate mammal, every human being, every it, mammal with a backbone, there's what's called the endocannabinoid system. It's kind of like a, um, it regulates most, almost all your bodily functions, like pain, sleep, appetite, uh, temperature. And it's really an amazing, an amazing thing. Um, so, so CBD and THC are cannabinoids. They're like, the best way to describe them, they're like keys, like cellular keys. And your body has receptors. CB1s and CB2s are the most popular, the most well-known receptors in your body. And they're like locks. So the, so the cannabinoids are like the keys going to the cell receptors and do different things. And it's really, really fascinating. I think, I think we just, we really just, just scratched the surface on what, what cannabinoids can do for you for health-wise. Not just from a um, you know remedy or curative standpoint, but from a preventive standpoint, help you live a longer and, and better life. Um, the biggest lesson in the in the um, uh, description of my talk, it mentioned what hemp's taught me about life, liberty, and happiness, and it really reinforces a lot of things we learned here about you know government is a scam, government's corrupt, <laughs> and totally yes, but with healthcare. The best advice I can give to every one of you here is invest in your health and stay the hell out of the hospital. For God's sake, <laughs> you can all help. I couldn't help. I mean, if you, if you have to go, you have to go. But it's just the biggest racket. I mean, you go to the hospital to get fixed. You don't go to the hospital to get well. You know? Yeah. You exactly. That's you go and, home to get well. And modern medicine isn't about cures, but it's about keeping you as a customer. Right. Right. Um, I knew someone with, with prostate cancer, and uh, what's really weird, they just, they, it's, you know, modern medicine is quite up on, on you know, um, natural medicine, cannabinoids, and, and so on, and they give them a shot of, kind of give them shots of blue to, you know, to reduce hormone levels and so on, hopefully, you know, to it fix it. But the, when, when the uh, PSA level got too high and they thought there was something they could do, they, they threw up their hands and said, hey, sorry. And it just really pissed me off because, I mean, you know, you're not going to live forever. I get that, but but um, but cannabis can give give patients more better quality of life, less pain, and I think I think it, it, the, the good thing about hemp being illegal, I think more medical cannabis being legal around the country, is that you're going to see more um, more doctors and professionals using using CBD. The CBD is starting to come around. People, are, people who I never thought would, you know, like old farm, well, farmers back where I'm from, in their 60s and 70s, yeah, I tried that CBD stuff. Works pretty good. I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I've talked about healthcare um, a little bit, and get, I'll go into agriculture and why it's, why hemp is still played a really important part in the, in the today and in the years to come. Um, as you may or may not know, the, the agricultural economy is pretty depressed. Um, prices for all grains are pretty much in the dumper. And, you know, the, obviously the Trump tra trade tariff talks aren't going too well right now. Um, Don't ask him that, because it's terrific. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, yeah, the tiger. Yeah. And, and, I think it's good. I mean, obviously, you want every, every president to fight for fight for your industry. But when if your industry needs a little trade deal to get better, your fundamentals aren't good. And that's why I see about with, with American grains. So as a farmer, what I noticed several years ago, I saw um, three years before harvest, and the price dropped by, for, for wheat dropped about twenty five percent in less than two months. I was pissed. I'm like, shit. <laughs> busting my ass, and we're not getting anything for this crop. And so I started to think about it, and agriculture's kind of been, American farmers are kind of, we're kind of our own worst enemy in a way, because our productivity works, works against us. Um, so the cycle is, because the farmers are in the cycle, the prices go down, you pour in the temples, you pour in the fertilizer, 
get the, to get the yields up, is to grow your way out of it. And then economics 101, as we know, is the higher supplies puts down pressure on the prices. It's a cycle around and around, and then I'm thinking, okay, where, where do we get out of this? This doesn't make any sense. So, and the same applies for, for, um, for corn and soybeans. Um, it's, you know, farmers have been too good at producing, and we've relied in, in the past on, on, um, on foreign exports to, to a large degree. And up until recently, up until probably about the last five, seven years, American farmers were the, Lord, the world's ag superpower. Nobody could compete with us. We literally fed the world. But nowadays, that's not that's not the case. There's a lot of different countries that are that are competing and can do as good as jobs as we can. And our net exporters of different crops. Um, so, quick quiz: Who's which country in the world is the largest exporter of wheat? No. Nope. Russia. Russia. Ukraine. But, yeah, Russia. And that's crazy because 20 years ago, Russian agriculture was an absolute joke. You know, the Soviet Union collapsed. They were still in shambles. But over the years, I don't know what they did to do it, but they're on, when you look at the numbers, they're on par with productivity of the American farmers. They can grow as, just as good as we can. Well, yeah, they got hungry. They got hungry, yeah, that's, that's true. And China being the next door neighbor, yeah. it just makes sense. Then, you know, um, you know, it's it's, it's uh, less transportation costs, less shipping costs, and the ruble's cheaper than the dollar as well. You know, it's with corn and soybeans, you have so Brazil's now the second largest soybean grower in the world, and we don't have the leverage we used to in this, as far as trade deals. I think Trump's trying as best he can to do it, but there's just there's just no leverage, or not not much leverage. China still has a lot, about a billion mouths to feed, so I think they might, you know, they might be, be give concessions over time. But I'm not too bullish as, as far as the long term, the long term aspects of, of um, traditional grains. Um, another thing that that, uh, that the current farming system has, has gotten us to, it's really it's benefited big corporations like Monsanto, Simplot, and so on. And they're making the money, and farmers are basically not. Um, farmers make about, on average, about up to 15% of the retail food dollar. So for every dollar you spend in the grocery store, only a fraction of that goes to the, goes to the, the producer of the food. And that's just not sustainable anymore. I'm looking at the, at the input prices have gone up, prices have stayed stagnant, slightly higher. Um, I just think campus is is a great alternative um, to traditional grains. And the cool thing about hemp is it's more than just food. It, it, could, it can, like I said, it can provide the mechanical article. It can produce a, um, plenty of different, different products. There's CBD, cannabinoids. Um, there's a oil company that they used hemp for a sealant. They were really good. They do fracking to keep the fracking fluids from going into the, into the underground water supply. So, um, so they say. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not it's like perfect, but I think it's, it, I think it's innovative. Like, you know, big oil is not, hasn't been traditionally, traditionally a, bet, a great um, ally of, of alternative crops, or alternative ideas. So, um, it's interesting. And there's so many, there's just so many uses available for, you know, for the crop, um, and there are jobs being, and that is it's creating jobs in rural states, you know, that have to grow hemp. Um, Kentucky, I read a read an article a year or two ago that, that Kentucky is, I think grown, like last year or the year before, it grew about 3,500 acres of hemp, and for every 40 acres, it created one full-time job, and that's, you know, it's, it, we're still in the end of early stages of, of um, you know, the, the hemp industry. As it grows, as it matures, as we get more and more, more research and more uses, I think it'll it'll just be. You know, I think we'll see a lot of a lot of growth, a lot of innovation in, in the industry. Um, so, to give you an idea, there's a, there was a recently there was a <coughs> North Colorado Hemp Expo 
in, um, here in Denver, it was about, about a month or two ago. 10,000 attendees, over 200 businesses were exhibiting. And it was, it was crazy. So I think there's, there's no doubt that it's, a, it's an industry on the rise. And I think as, we, as, we, as the regulations come off the hemp industry, you'll see more uses, more innovation. I think it will help us live more free in, a, in an increasingly unfree world. So um, that's basically what I've got. Um, I may kind of ramble through it, but I hope it makes some sense. And um, I'll just go ahead and take questions. Thanks. How can you ensure that you're getting a good quality CBD and stuff that's actually effective instead of things that are maybe not so pure? Great question. A lot of us kind of trial and error, just have to try the product and see how it works. But the good ones will have lab testing to back it up. So a lot of you, you know, some CBD companies that will have their copies of their lab tests that come to the product. And that's the that's what I look for. If you're, if you're looking for a, for a good, you know, on a CBD website, if they do third party testing, that's that's a key, that's a must. But just it's no substitute for just trying it yourself. Um, I can tell you a good couple good, good companies, Lacuna Botanicals have a great sleep product. That's outstanding. Um, CW Hemp is, is good stuff. Bluebird is also, Bluebird Botanicals is a good product as well. So there's some great, great companies here in Colorado and you go to the dispensaries as well and they can hook up with some, some really good, good product. Oh, thank you. There's uh, uh, one of the things when we were talking about sourcing before, you're fortunate enough to be surrounded by a lot of great hemp farms and a lot of people that are developing new cultivars, like he was talking about regarding strain specific hemp. And so your, your, your blessing and your curse is that you're surrounded by seeds, goods, you're surrounded by bee birds, you're surrounded by all these, you know, all these other CBD companies, but uh, your blessing is that you can literally call them on the phone and they can bring things to you. And a lot of these people are very, very interested in getting out their information because they're wallowing around in a sea of, you know, they're trying, they're trying to differentiate themselves as well in a lot of sea of competition. So if you were in a place that did not have as good of a hemp network as we have here in Colorado, you might have more challenges on the quality of CBD. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And a lot of CBD companies, this is very, very similar to, I said the dot com over 20 years ago. A lot of companies are, or even the, the car company, the, um, or the automobile business was 100, 100 years ago. A lot, of, a lot of companies in place trying to make, the, you know, make their way out. Um, and there's going to be a lot of consolidation that's happening over, over time. But really, it's, it's, the reason it's fun in this industry is there's so much innovation, there's so much you know, differentiation and competition, and it's, it's really um, a fun time. So. Great question. Are there any, any hemp stocks you're looking at? Um, I know CW Hemp is publicly traded. It's over the counter. I think it's like between the yeah, Charlotte's about definitely is. Yeah. 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 And my, um, not that I know of. Um, I think they're a solid company. I think they're they're pretty much one of the the, the Cadillac brands in the, in the business right now. I think the best way you can I don't know. You can look for you can look for penny stocks. That's one way to profit. I think the best thing you can do in, in general, whether you're in the hemp business or not, is just invest in your own skills and, and getting those better. That's the best, the best thing I can recommend. Sure, but if you can get a hot stock or, a, or, or an option, that's great, nothing wrong with that. As manipulated as these markets are on a day-to-day -day basis, it, it's kind of crazy. I, I mean, I'll admit I'm, I'm, a, I'm a better long-term trends forecaster than I am a, a short-term trader. But with all the manipulation there is in, in, in different stocks and in, in industries, it's, at least in the short term, it's hard. Unless you have a lot of patience and a lot of money, it's, it's not the easiest thing to day trade. 
And you can do it if you're an algo wizard. God bless you. More power to you. But I, I think that's. I wouldn't spend. I wouldn't spend a lot of time looking at, at trying to find the hot stocks. I'd say just, just um, invest in your own skills. And whatever you do, at least what you already know this is, is play the long game. Mm. You know, um, <laughs> you know it may take some more time and work and patience, and you're not gonna be able to cut corners. But just do things the right way. Treat people right. Give good value. And, and don't try and get a quick buck. That's just the, that's just not the way to, to do it. Oh well, yeah, I mean it's not as fun, but it's it's that's I'm kind of old fashioned. That's the way I look at things. So we know that Canada is a huge exporter, and they have some advantages because they have started first. Where are the American farmers as far as trying to catch up with the advantages that Canada has, or are we piggybacking on their markets? Great question. So the question is, where are American farmers as far as uh, innovation compared to Canada? And for people I've talked to, it's people I've talked to and companies I've talked to at different high schools, I think we're doing just fine. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of creativity in, in, in the hemp space. Um, so I don't think we're really we're on anybody's coattails. I think it's, there's a lot of a lot of good like, good companies, a lot of good products and, and services. Um, so I think we're I think American entrepreneurs in the industry are doing doing just fine yes. as far as I can see. Yeah. I have some friends in Central Kansas, and they were talking about how they started to loosen the regulations on Kansas. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, do you feel like it's going stepping, like that's just like the first step, or like what was the actual loosening? Like what was it? Okay. Oh, great. I forgot to mention this. Thanks for bringing this up. Yeah. Where are you in Kansas, by the way? Okay. Our farm is in extreme northwest Kansas. Oh, okay. Like SA or something. Oh no, no, we're farther north, like uh, oh, okay. north of Goodland. Okay. Oh yeah. 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 Um, so about Kansas regulation, this is oh, this this can more more confirmation that government is that government sucks. <laughs> so anyway, when I first got the back in January is when they get released the regulations. They went through all their you know and they turned don't sign off on it and this and that. And I'm, this is like 60 pages on a PDF file. I get a page 25 and I'm like, this is bullshit. I, and I went to the <laughs> bar and had a drink. Seriously, I, it was just so restricted. It was like. So the so the fees were restricted to begin with. So you need to some of these things are still in place, but first of all you have to get fingerprinted for a background check. Yeah. Yeah, no joke. Yeah. Forty seven dollar fee for that. Oh yeah. Two hundred dollar application fee. And it's it's in this it's about research. They want you to ask, okay, what are you doing this for? What strains are you growing? What's what's your intent? You know, blah blah. Just right. it's just bureaucratic groups, it's bullshit. It's trying to, you're not going to give it to eight year olds. <laughs> right, right. And they wanted the license plate, the license number of every, everybody who's going to be on the property, the license plate number of every vehicle that's going to be on the property, and if you add or subtract anything from what was originally put on there, you had to pay a $750 change fee. So that was, was really, really stupid. Luckily, they, they got rid of that. They passed new legislation in the spring, and, that, and they got rid of most of that bullshit. So the license fees are still a little steep. For a grower, it's a thousand. Distributor, two thousand. Processor, three thousand. So it's it's not as bad. Um, I think the reason that these regulations were in place is because traditional crops interest didn't want to be. They just don't didn't want to see hemp plant. You know. Oh yeah. They, they think there's a lot of people in Kansas in the rural states. I think they want to see you know Kansas, Nebraska agriculture or other agriculture great again. As long as it's wheat, corn, and soybeans, but that's not going to happen. And there's just no the markets just aren't aren't there. So that's an interesting question. Yeah, the regulations were stupid. They're getting better. I think over time they'll get. But the next step is getting the THC level raised from 0.3 percent to 22 percent. We got 22 percent, but but yeah, it's really, it's really it really makes it difficult. To, you got to test. You got to be really, especially if you're, if you're on CBD for CBD. You really got to be on. Um, because the really screwed thing these laws are, if, if, your, if your crop tests hot, you can't save the, the fiber of stock. They want you to destroy the whole plant. Yeah, you can't save well, Which makes no sense at all. And that's what we're, that's the next step we're, we're trying to, I know, I know it just makes your head hurt. Yeah. 
Brian, can you talk a little bit about when new products are introduced into the hemp market, how that affects the supply and demand of the hemp market? I mean, like, if there, let's take for instance, uh, in industrial hemp, we start working with industrial concrete and how that separates the market from, and it, it causes prices to spike in different areas, and how that translates. Okay, so the question is about how, how new, new hemp products affects the, the markets. Um, my best answer is that is it depends. Okay. Um, I think concrete is a is a great substitute for regular concrete. As far as I can see, it's it's um, it's lighter, it's it's as strong, uh, mold resistant. I'm not sure. I don't know, I don't know the numbers. I don't know how it, how it compares to regular concrete. Um, but I think it, there's going to be a lot of disruption in a lot of industries in the future. So, um, I think to a large degree that would be a good thing. We've got new, new industries, new innovations. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's my best answer. So, new innovations. Anybody else? Uh, I just wanted to jump in on what Brandon was asking earlier. So if you check out labdoor.com, they do third-party testing of CBD and like 100 other supplements, but they will break it down by the amount of THC or lead that's in the CBD and everything else. So before I buy any supplement, I check it out on labdoor.com. Labdoor? Labdoor. I think uh, Lazarus Naturals is number one. So if you want to buy CBD, they have an A ranking on labdoor.com. Wow. There's so many of those review services, and they're, most of them are pay to play. So watch out for that. Yeah, they're actually a crypto back. Uh, oh, nice. So the can pay them in kip? Okay. <laughs> um, they, they have a token. I don't know. Oh, do they? They, 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 they have their own token, yeah. Cool. Now, okay, that's another good question because we're talking about banking in, in the cannabis industry and we're looking at the banking bill coming through and we're hoping that we're allowing green money into the system. How does the separation of hemp help that the banking problems? <laughs> in the cannabis industry are we is hemp being used as a way to assuage bankers into allowing more green money into the system i think it, it does it, it'll bankers are you know you know some of the most conservative people around <laughs> they're, they're the most risk risk averse to a, to a team but i think with the, with the hemp bill um with hemp being legalized with the 2018 barn bill that, and and take, it's taken off the, the controlled substance list, so it's not, it's, not, it's not under the enforcement of the DEA anymore, which is great. Now the FDA is trying to get their, get their hooks into it. A lot of companies are just basically saying, you know, booger off, we don't care. Like, more about selling CBD. Um, so I think the horse might be out of the barn if, if, if the FDA, FDA can weigh it in again. I hope they don't. I just, just tell them that, hey, leave us alone. We don't, we don't want this. Transportation. The reason that I'm asking some of these questions is because I have some friends that are starting a brokerage. And one of the stories recently is when a uh, load of hemp was passing through a state, I think it was Illinois, and they got uh, the load confiscated because they couldn't tell the difference between hemp and weed, even though they have the COA. Right. What are the rules? specified for transportation? Is it because there has to be, it does the hip have to be pulverized to a certain degree so it's not recognizable or usable otherwise? Or are, are new agricultural rules in place where you can send bulk product because otherwise we're, we're talking a lot of additional steps for in, into the uh, infrastructure? Yeah, about hemp transportation between states, uh, there was one instance of a a ship got busted in Oklahoma, one got busted in Idaho. I think they, one of those two states, one of those two states, they've been, the charges have been dropped, I think. Um, but really, it's, it's hard to say. I'm not a hemp lawyer, I'm, you know, I don't know the laws in every, every state, so it varies state by state. Um, I was at work in Kansas, let's say, and because you're familiar with Kansas. Okay? Oh yeah. And, and Kansas had already had some serious green challenges with us. And now that they're entering into the hemp world, how is their cannabis transportation laws from from seed to sale? 
I'm not really sure. It's gonna, it's, time will tell. Um, the three, one of the three big industries, that, law enforcement is one of the three big industries against, against hemp and cannabis in general. You've got big pharma slash healthcare, big alcohol, and law enforcement. Because they all make a ton. That's odd. Why, why would that be? Yeah. <laughs> Because Bubba loves his drug bust. <laughs> that's the reason. No, that's what these. That's the mentality of these folks. And a lot of cops, that, you know, you talk to or hear people talk to, they know marijuana is not danger. I mean, they'd rather they'd rather go with the guy that's that's baked instead of trying to find a drunk that you know thinks he's ten foot tall and bulletproof. Um, so the answer is is this, I'm not sure about that. How about the transportation? I think as people, it will take time for people to get educated. And say, hey, we're not trying to become Pablo Escobar of the Midwest. You know, we're just we're just trying to we're just trying to grow a crop. That's it, man. That's that's why I keep telling people over and over again. So, but the one encouraging thing, I'm mean, thinking of something else. Over the years, when I've been talking about having people in, in rural states, maybe like when you talk to people who are statists and, and don't see don't understand liberty very well. For the statist. Right. <laughs> you might get me some weird looks, like, oh, what's what's that about? You know. But just. The thing is, if you know you're right, if you're on the right side, you stick to your guns, you stick to your principles, and people will come around. Because, as I see it, the public school system has brainwashed kids and people so badly just to, just to follow orders, not to think critically, not to think outside of the box. So, um, and the best way you persuade people on, whether it's on hemp, on liberty in general, is just ask questions. Get people thinking. Because a lot of Americans don't think very much anymore. You can probably, probably tell. But that's the best way I can, the best advice I can give you is just, is just give, challenge your status quo. Give them, you know, plant the seed. It's like farming, you know. Plant the seed, hey. Plant the seed. No, hey, yeah. that's a pun. Hey, oh. It's better than hey, oh. the pun, so. Uh, <laughs> as long as it's not more than 0.3% THC. Well, I know, that, exactly. You gotta get those, those laws, you know. You get law biter. Um, now, okay. You. Did speak about the differentiation between the different cannab cannabinoids, mm -hmm. the CBNs, the CBGs, the CBOs. Those are coming with different growth schedules. Are farmers looking at those different growth schedules for one? A CBN-rich plant is only is four weeks shorter growth period than a CBD-rich plant. Does that? How does that change the market for him? Good question. Um, and the question was like, how different cannabinoids affect the farmer's decision on what, what seeds to plant? I think right now people are just getting, at least in Kansas, they're just, they're just planting the first crop, they want to see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, they really haven't thought that far ahead. I've been thinking about that though, because I gotta check the, the, the prices on that. So, so for extract a kilo of oil, CBD oil, price range is anywhere from like, I think, 1,500, 4,000-ish, I'm just, just a ballpark figure. Compare that for CBG and CBN, I've heard figures quoted in the low to mid five figures. So it's a big difference as far as potential profitability. The danger with, now getting back to the, to the THC levels, whenever you have any, any strain that has higher cannabinoids, higher CBG, CBD, CBG, CBN, it also has higher levels of THC. So you have to be really, really watchful and you have to test early and test often. And then if you're if you get close to getting hot, you gotta be ready to harvest and, and get in there as quickly as possible. So that's the reason we're, we're why I'm I'm lobbying and getting our lobbies to Topeka to get this, this THC levels raised, just give us more flexibility. And not just that, but also if it does test hot, you know, at least at least we can sell the fiber of the stock. You know, not not destroy destroy the whole plant, which is really ridiculous. So Let's do one or two more from someone who's not Rodney. <laughs> Rodney's at six already. Right? Any other questions? That's six. Expand on the breeze to plant the business in and then stock. Sure. So, so the question is um, so on the statement on the different uses of cannabis or different uses of hemp, um, the, main the main revenue sources are seed, fiber, and, and CBD. Um, Hemp seeds are pretty nutritious. You can, just, you, know, you can buy them at the health food store. They got a, a good balance of omega threes and omega sixes. Um, 
the the uh, the, the oil, CBD oil, that's not great for this. You know, I think people should take CBD on a daily basis, like like a daily supplement. Um, and the fiber, it's it's a, it's a crazy plant. It's like bamboo. It's very very tough, and it's you can make it for a lot of different um, have paper, textiles, clothing. Um, and space and other other possible uses, but yeah, it's it's a really you know s strong, sturdy, and and versatile plant. So yeah, that's that's another reason why I like it better than than wheat corn or soybeans, is because with wheat or corn, you know, you just got harvest from the seed, you go to the elevator, maybe a feedlot buyer, and that's like your market. You're, you're basically you know you're, you're a captive market. Um, and I'm I ready to just, to just to get out of the you know get out of the big ag mainstream and and go direct to consumers and go direct to different companies. And that's, and that's about, if we can help more more smaller and medium sized companies thrive and prosper, we'll be able, I think we'll be a freer. That's a, that's, a, that's a, be a more free country and more free industry. I think. I agree. Last question. Something to close. Yeah. Last question. Not and quite it. a question, but hey, Last my it. granddad was a farmer in Missouri, tobacco, oh. corn, and wheat. Mm -hmm. In Missouri, he was born in 1907. He had chairs on his patio in the front of his house made of hemp leaves. So I know what this fiber is. The, yeah, the wrapped around woven stuff was hemp. And I remember him telling me, um, used to be for, he's a bit misinformed, but he said, used to be for rope, now it's for dope. Yeah. <laughs> you, ever, you ever smoke a chair, bro? <laughs> you right. 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 yeah, that's, that's, okay. yeah, that's, that's a mis the misconception, you know. Um, that's where you get the, you know, the CV versus THC, but, but um, yeah, I think the best thing you can do is, for the hemp industry, I'll close with this, the best thing you can do for the hemp industry and liberty in general is just get the word out to the people, control the narrative, you know, control the English will chirp it's debated on, and then that will be a long ways towards getting, you know, ask questions, get people to think critically, and um, hopefully we'll see more liberty and freedom in our lifetime. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. We will be back in three weeks, the first week of June. Uh, so don't show up in two weeks. So have a good night. Keep fighting the state.